I'll just put it. I'll put it on YouTube, and then you and I'll put the link in Blackboard. Awesome, thank you. I'll put much. it under the video folder, and I'll just label it uh, Zoom Help Session. Okay. All right. Feel free to turn on your your videos, guys. It's fun to see your nice little faces, so I can see if you're sticking your tongue out at me or flipping me off. Oh hi. All right. So. Uh, so I'm just going to go through, like I say, there's, there's 70, well, uh, I think I've actually cut out about 25 questions. So I think right now there are 50. So it's not as bad as it was. I, I took out a few that I thought we hadn't really covered. So, okay. So, so I'm just going to go, I'm kind of going to go through them. I, I'm not going to read the question, but I'll talk about it. So, so you, you should definitely know that the assembly language in the KL 25 Z, which we really haven't covered, but, but the assembly language is set up, um, to be uh, basically, it's set up to be to implement compiled C code. That's the whole point, and it's not really set up to be hand coded. Okay, um, so when when you uh, so you need to know some of the you know, there, there are some questions on C. So for instance, you need to know how to set a mask. Now I I know I went over this in Micro One. I I in the process of grading the the Micro One programming test. Still, I hadn't gotten that done yet, but. But I, I just can't believe how many students are confused about this. This is really simple. So let me let me let me share my screen and I'll go through this because I, I can't understand why it is such a problem. All right, so let's see. I'll do this screen here and share, and then let me bring up the little projector over here. Can't turn this on. Oops. Okay, and let me grab some paper. I know I, I need, you guys definitely need to know how to do this. This is, I mean, if you do anything in the digital world, it, this is, you just need to know how to do this. It's just crazy. Okay, all right, so let me pull this up. There it is, all right. All right, so can you, all right, can you see this? Yes, sir. All right, that's pretty good. All right, and let me focus it. Okay, let me go on and focus it. Well, let me do it, now we'll focus it. All right. All right. So let's say we want to set, let's say we want to set bit, um, you know, 25, 17, and nine. Okay, in a, in a register. So how would you create a mask to do that? And the simple way is to shift one. And so usually, so since we're going to set, we want ones, where we want to, where we want the action. Okay. So so that's because we're setting. All right. So so what we would do, we would take a one and we would shift it 25 times. And then we would or that with a one shifted 17 times. And we'd or that with a one shifted nine times. And that would be our mask, this whole thing. Now notice we wanna put brackets around this because unless we happen to know for absolute certain that shift has a higher precedence than the or, which I don't think it does. Uh, so it's it's good. To, it's good. It might. I don't remember. But anyway, so it's good to put parentheses so you know you're going to do the shifting first, then you're going to or it with this, and then you're going to so forth do this. And so one of the one of the tests I just graded, the student did something like this. Only they did, only the, they inverted all of these, and then they used logical ors in between. It makes no sense at all. Remember, if you have if you have a binary number like 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and you logically or that with 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, what do you get? All ones? No, you get, you get all zeros except a 1. You said if you or it? Logical or it. So bitwise or is this. Logical or is that? 
right? Okay. Yes. So when you whenever you do the logical, you're only going to get one of two answers, zero or one. That's it. No other no other outcome is possible. So it's I mean, and logical R definitely has its place, but normally you're using logical R <clears throat> when you when you want to look at a value in a strictly Boolean way. You want to say uh, if you want to say is this true or is it false? That's what logical implies. And so anything that's not zero is true and only zero is false. Okay, so, so you can see why when you invert this, now you have zero, 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 you have, uh, yeah, sorry, you have all ones except you have a zero at position 25. And then you logically or that. So all these are gonna be true, 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 true. This is gonna give you one. It doesn't, it's just silly. That's not a useful mask. Why didn't you just make the mask one? That would have been a lot easier. So uh, anyway, okay, so let's do a different one. Does, does that make sense? All right. So basically you have to invert uh, the whole thing, right? Oh, oh, no. Okay, let's do it again. Oh, let's, let's, so I'm not trying to, I don't wanna make fun of anybody. And Ahmed, you're smart, so I know you can get this. So just think, okay? So, but we need zero in, in the place of the ones to set it, right? No, if you're gonna set it, you want ones. Well, I thought I thought for the, this chip, we need zero. Okay, no, no, no. This chip's kind of unusual. It's, it has built-in functions that allow you to only use ones for setting, clearing, and toggling. But normally you need zeros for clearing, ones for toggling and setting. Okay. Got it. So let's look at that. Let's just look at how the C would go. So let's say you want to, let's say, let, let's go back to this. Okay. Let's say you want to clear bits 25, 17, and 9 in a register without affecting any other bit. Okay. How would you do that? Well, here's how you do it. You take the same thing we did up here without the logical orders. Okay. So we'll just copy that. So you take a one, shift to 25, or bitwise ORD with one shifted 17, bitwise ORD with one shifted nine. Now, now we want to clear. And so what we do, we put brackets around this whole thing. And now we bitwise invert the whole thing with the tilde. We don't use the exclamation mark because that's a logical inversion. So that would turn this into a zero. So what we, what we want is a bitwise. So now the bitwise is going to take this. So now you're going to have before the bitwise. So you're, you're going to, it's, this is all going to become, you know, 31, 30, 29, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. It's going to take this and it's going to turn it into It's going to turn into that, right? Can you lift the paper? Oh, sorry. So, so here's what it is. So 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, well, whatever. Maybe 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. Okay, call this 26. 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. I guess I screwed this up. So this will be 10 probably anyway, but you get the idea. So, so then, so everywhere, when you invert it bitwise, you invert all the zeros to ones and all the ones to zero. So now we've got a zero here, a zero here and a zero there. And now what we do in our C code, we'll say this is define mask equals whatever, or well, yeah. Or we, we can do the equate or we can do a pound define, whatever. Anyway, we don't have to use the equal if we do the define, there's just a space there. All right, so we would basically write this pound define mask mask one, and then we would then we would write uh, one shifted twenty five or with one shifted seventeen or with one shifted nine, and then put brackets around the whole thing and put the tilde out here so you invert everything. So that's the mask, okay? 
you can also forget the tilde and, and, and invert the mask later on. So now in the code, what you want to do, let's say we don't have the tilde here. So we just have a mask with just the ones in places. So we have this thing right here, OK? So now what we do when we write our C code, somewhere down here, we're writing our C code. So what we would do, we would say, uh, let, let's say the let, let's say there's a variable or let's say there's a port. So we'll call it port A. Uh, so port A, port A, or well, well in this case we'll say R equals mask. This is going to set 25, 17, and nine, and it's leave and leave everything else alone. But if we said port A. ampersand equals tilde mask, then that's going to clear all the same ones. And then if we say port A exclusive or mask, then that's going to that's going to toggle seven, 25, 17, and 9. So you, you guys should understand this. This should be as clear in your mind as a steel trap, OK? No question about it. This should be very straightforward in your thinking. Oh, sorry, you can't see. So does that make sense? Everybody should know this cold. This I, Because I've been beating it into your head since micro one. And this is how, and if you look at, the, if you look at these, if you look at these, these files, this is how they do this. These, these, this is exactly the way this code is written. So if you don't understand this, you can't read the stupid code we're trying to use because it's, this is what they do. The, the, all, all this, this fancy system software where, they, where they've created all these neat, out, you know, neat drivers for us and APIs, this is how they're written. And only it's even worse because they don't, they don't write it like this. The way they write it, they write it, uh, they write it, you know, they write it, uh, you know, um, FSL underscore TPM underscore uh, clock, clock underscore frequency underscore uh, set. And then this is, this is the mat and maybe, it, and then mask. <laughs> and then they, this is what they're going to, put in that. That's what they're going to use. And then half the time, they're going to or that with something else and something else. And then they're going to finally write that. And uh, or even worse, what they what you have to do is create a structure. And then you have to populate the structure with their enumerated lists. Uh, you, you know, if we pull up, if we pull up, where's MCU Expresso? If we pull up these enumerated lists, you just realize it's all enumerated lists all the time. It's just crazy. I'll let that come up. So anyway, so this is the kind of stuff you see, and you and what they're doing is they're exactly what I just did. They're this, they're creating a mask with this, and because they've got these thirty-two bit fields that they're setting two or three bits in, and and you know the only you know easy way to do that is to use these masks that are predefined in header files, so that you so that you know what they're doing. Because otherwise, if they just start setting bits, now you've got to go pull up the manual. You've got to go to the page where that where that register is talked about. So, for instance, uh, I mean, if we look at the manual, let's see, where is the manual? Let's see, here. I'll pull up the manual. Okay, so here's the manual, and if we go down here. Um, so let's go to our, well, let's see. Yeah, let's go to our pin control registers. Let's see, uh, I think they're in the, well, okay, we'll go to the SIM module. I know if it's there for sure. So, uh, so he, here's port control. Uh, is that right? Port control interrupts, I think. Uh, well, I think this is it, let's see. So here, here's here are the registers, and they have all these all these modes. Okay, so we have pin control register for port A. We have pin control register zero, pin control register one, and they're all very similar. 
and they look like this. So here's the 32-bit field, bit 31 all the way down to bit zero. So notice we have an interrupt service, uh, an interrupt flag here, the interrupt status flag, ISF, and that gets set when the interrupt condition is met on this pin. Now, it may not cause an interrupt. It depends on what you set this IRQC field. Down here, you see the, uh, so it's zero when there's no interrupt, one when there is. Then the IRQC field, you can, you can set it up to trigger a DMA function, or you can trigger an interrupt with logic zero, rising edge, falling edge, either edge, or logic one. So it's pretty powerful. And then, then we have, then we have a whole bunch of bits that aren't used. Then we have this multiplexer setting. The multiplexer setting, you have to go here in chapter 10, scroll down to the multiplexer thing. You have to read down, let's say this is PC, this is pin A0. So here's pin A0. So the default channel is the default multiplexer setting is here. Alt zero, alt one, alt two, alt three, alt four, alt five, alt six, alt seven. There's eight different choices. And here's so. The default is our, our software, uh, our software clock, uh, SWD clock. I'm not, yeah. I'm, and then the, the default channel or the uh, the analog, the uh, the zero setting is the touch sense channel one. Default, uh, the setting one is always GPIO, that's PTA zero. And then there's a, a TPM zero channel five. TPM zero has six channels, TPM one has two, and TPM two has two. And so this would be TPM zero channel five. And then over here, you another, another SWD clock. I don't actually know what SWD clock is. I'd have to look that up. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, that may be the input. I don't know. Or, or here, here we have our, our system integration module where we have our, our various registers. The one we're interested in for turning on clocks is a system clock gate control register five sim underscore SCGC5. And if we look at that, look, bit 13 turns on the clock for your port E, bit 12 for port D, bit 11 for port C, bit 10 for port B, bit nine for port A, and this one for the touch sense module. And this one for the low voltage, uh, the low power timer. And the rest of, the, rest of the, the fields don't do anything. And so they have a mask. A mask you know, says uh, port E, clock enable mask, you know, port E underscore clock underscore enable underscore mask. And so, and what it'll have, it'll have all zeros and a one in bit 13. And, and the way they'll do that, they'll do that just like we just did. They'll, they'll write it, this, this mask will be, you know, port, port E underscore clock underscore enable underscore mask. And it'll be set equal to somewhere in a header file with a pound define. They don't, you don't have to use the equal sign. You just put a space there. And then over here, they'll set it equal to one shifted 13 times. And that's how they set that up. And you can see, you've got to understand this stuff if you're ever going to read those stupid files. OK, so are we clear on mass? It's pretty simple. I mean, it's not complicated, but it is conf it's, it's hellaciously confusing when you first look at it. You go, what, what in the world's going on? But then you stop and think, all they're doing is putting a one somewhere in a 32-bit field. That's all they're doing. And then if they, put, if they want another one, then they're going to OR them together. Now, what gets a little bit upsetting is a lot of times before they change a setting, they'll clear the field. So first they'll and something and then they'll or something, which that gets that gets really weird. But they'll do that so that they make sure that they don't say, so when we so when let's say you have a three-bit field, you know, like the, the multiplexer setting in the middle of the pin control register, and you want to get, and I forget what I forget where those were. Uh, I mean we have it right here, wherever it was. Uh, back to the pin control. So let's let's go to this and so okay so the multiplexer fields bit 10 9 and 8 okay so watch what they'll do first first they will they will set up they will set up uh so they'll they'll set up 3 
No, they'll set up seven and they'll shift seven. They'll shift seven uh, eight times. Okay, so they shift seven eight times and then what they'll do is, uh, is they will uh, tilde that and they then they'll do, uh, you know, uh, port, port A, PC, R0, uh, and then they'll do uh, ampersand equal, can't do an ampersand, this, this thing right here. And that'll clear those bits. And then what they'll do, then they'll R equal, they'll do the same thing, port A, PC, R0, R equal, and then they'll set, maybe they'll put, maybe they'll put, uh, you know, a five there, shifted eight times. And they won't invert that. And then what you get done, that field will be one, zero, one. But if they didn't do this, if they just shifted two bits, like five, then they'd set this bit. But what if this bit were already set? Then you'd have the wrong number. So you have to clear it first. And the only other way to do it is to write the whole register, but that screws with that screws with all the other settings. So you it, you may want you may only want to change this one setting, and you don't want to affect. Uh, oh, oh, I see. You couldn't see that. Uh, well, anyway. So if 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 you so here's your field, right? It, if you only want to change this, you don't want to change the flag. You don't want to change the IRQ setting. You don't want to change the the drive strength enable the uh, the the passive filter enable, uh, I forget what SRE is. Uh, um, slew rate, yeah, slew rate. And, and then you have the pull up enable and then the pull up status, whether it's up or down. So this turns on the pull up pulls and this is makes it either go up or down. So, so you don't wanna change this stuff. You only wanna affect these three bits. So you have to use masks to do that. Because if you just write the register, you're going to change every bit in the register. Now, you could read the register, but then you still have to store that in a location, change the bits you want to change, and then write it back. You still have to use a mask. It doesn't save you. So, so you basically, you're stuck with using these masks all the time. It's the only way it works. All right. So let me stop sharing. OK, does that make sense? You don't seem convinced, Sherilyn. I mean, it's, I have to start working on it, like, you know, decoding it in a sense yeah. that I mean, I definitely understand what you're coming from, from last semester, yeah. Right, you, 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 the easiest way to do that is just, just to, so, so go into Code Warrior, you know, let me share again, I'll show you. This is, I mean, this is a perfect example. So you should, you should look at this code. So here, so here, here's a program. Here's so here's the software we're going to use. I know this is small. You probably can't see it, but if you so I'm going to I'm going to pull up the uh, the TPM the TPM code. So so look at how that. Well, so first of all, look at the header file, and here's how the header file is set up. Look at this. It's got it's got all these enumerations. This is an enumeration of no output signal, toggle on match, uh, clear on match, set on match. High pull, set output, low pull, set output, rising edge, falling edge, rising edge after. That's for the compare and capture stuff. Uh, Prescale will divide by 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So we're using 128. And that puts that puts uh, a three-bit value of 7 in the field. And and all this is in this register in, in the, but but they don't, but so then you have this structure. So now they create a structure. And they're going to write that. They've broken down all the fields in this in this register that they're going to configure, and then they're going to use these enumerations so that you you have a name for what that field does and what what change what values you're changing it to, and and um, and and here this is global time base trigger select enable those enable debug mode enable load on trigger uh, enable stop on overflow enable start on trigger whatever features that that showed. And, and so then, then you come down here and you see, uh, you know, so it, it actually, here it actually sets some of these things. Uh, and so you have this, you have this, uh, this is the function, okay? And anyway, so this, the structure is this configuration structure. 
and then you're you're using the dereferencing pointer here to point to the these items within the these uh, members of the class, members of the structure. So it's it's just a like here typical constant tpm underscore channel one underscore pwm underscore signal underscore parm underscore t and then the pointer to that is oops i didn't mean to do that is is channel parms channel params or whatever so these are here look at this so you see this one u shifted and then then you, here's how much it's going to shift and you have to calculate this stuff to figure it out now you can hover over it you can right click on it uh, you should be able to hover over it yeah so that expands to 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 seven u and then i don't know uh, and then if we go here this is a variable i think anyway so the, I know, definitely cleared up a lot like seeing it in code actually helped a lot yeah it's yeah. used all the time and, yeah, yeah. and it's just and you know, the, the more you look at it, the smarter you get and the faster you can understand it. But that's that's how they do stuff. And it's so confusing if you know if you don't understand how the mass works, you're just dead in the water looking at that stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so practice a little bit with mass. You just need to be really comfortable, you know, to be able to set bits wherever you want in that mask. Right. And we've been using that in all of our labs basically, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Ahmed? Yes, I was just a little bit confused with set and clear. Okay. I thought to set uh, is zero. <laughs> so now I got it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Wrong. <laughs> it's yeah. just the other opposite. <laughs> yep, I wrote. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, I, it's just a little bit of confusion is a killer. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I believe me, I mean, when I started looking, when I wanted to write this code, I had to go in there and merge a couple of these files. And, you know, it, it took me a long, I mean, I just had to read and read and read and read and read and then make a few little changes. If I'd known what to do, I could have done it in 10 minutes, but I had to read, you know, for hours and hours to figure out what to do. So, I mean, it's hard, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm much more, I mean, I, you know, back in the day when I was writing code, I was writing an assembly and we didn't have any of this stuff, you know, and what's worse, I didn't even show you this, but but uh, have you guys heard of doxygen? So so this is what's this is what doxygen's all about. So look at, so you come up here and well, in the header file, it's worse. See where they have this backslash star. Okay, that's fine. That's just a comment. And then they have exclamation at brief list of TPM flags. This at this exclamation mark and at brief. Those are those are commands to doxygen. And doxygen can read this file and generate a document that documents the code. And so this stuff's in there only for the benefit of doxygen. And, and so if you're not paying attention to doxygen, and then you see these grayed out areas, these are parts of the header file that don't apply to our chip. So and in some parts, there's big chunks, you know, grayed out. Thank God, because if they weren't here, you would have to read this define statement and figure out what this compiler directive was telling you about whether or not you had to worry about this chunk of code. Oh my God, what a pain in the butt. I mean, you know, and this is the stuff you're, I mean, if you do any, any embedded development, you're going to have to you, you know, you're going to pick your poison and then you're going to have to know this stuff called in order to, you know, maneuver around and write your code. But you, you'll get there. It's just a matter. It's all very straightforward. There's nothing. There's no quantum mechanics here. It's just it's just details that you have to understand. And they, they do have a lot of this at brief stuff. And then you can see here, then they then these comments at in, you know, uh, colon less than edge aligned and so so doxygen knows how to read this and pull out what it wants so it can write a nice it knows that it has to dot in, indent that and you know it, it it understands this whole you know how to how to how to make it look nice when it when it you 
run the file through Doxygen. I've never used Doxygen, but I know that's what they do. And same thing here, at name, driver version, all these are commands of Doxygen. Same thing here, this at, add to group TPN, at with a open thing. I, I mean, it's amazing. And I, I, I don't know where this, I don't know where this is supposed to go to, but somewhere down here, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, so that's, that's just there to throw you off, you know, make it even harder. Oh, I, I'm sorry, you couldn't see that. Well, whatever, anyway, okay, moving on. Okay, so let's see. Okay, why can't I see the file? Mm. What about Ellie? I think she got left outside because we're oh. just texting. Oh, I can't. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Wouldn't let me do it. Okay. It's recording. Okay, good. Okay, so let me figure out where I did with that file. Ah, there it is. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so make sure you can write a make sure you can write a little one line of code, or you would reckon you don't have to write anything, but you have to. It's multiple choice, but you have to recognize a line of code where you're gonna you're gonna wait on a bit to change, and how you would how you would set that up with a little mask. Uh, so you should be able to list the bitwise operators in C. So um, one of the interesting things is uh, is there such thing as a logical exclusive OR? And the answer is there is such a thing, but it doesn't exist in C. I guess I figured you didn't need it. It's kind of it kind of doesn't make any sense really, but anyhow, but it doesn't exist. There is no there is no logical exclusive or operator in C. Um, when you when you if you if you write you know zero shifted five times or zero shifted twenty times, what does does that do anything? No, that's right. Caitlin's on it. All right. Um, okay. So we normally want to divide our root, you know, our main routine. We want to have a part where we set everything up, and then we usually have, you know, a, a an infinite while loop or an infinite loop that we then, you know, do as long as the application is running. I mean, maybe not. There's some applications that don't work that way, but that's that's a typical construct. Um, Okay, so if you wanted to write a supercritical timing loop, what language would you write it in? Python. <laughs> no, you Python's interpreted. It'd be completely useless. Assembly. <laughs> no, you have to write it in assembly. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so uh, so the four wire. So so uh, I talked about the. We talked about the touch panel a little bit. So you know the touch panel has, it, it's a sandwich, right? It's got a bottom plate and a top plate. The, the bottom plate's pretty rigid piece of glass. The top plate is more flexible piece of glass. It's real thin, basically. That's why they're easy to break. And uh, when you, when you, uh, the, both plates are coated with a resistive coating. And one plate will have electrodes on, say, left and right. And the other will have electrodes on top and bottom or back and front. And when you, you have little spacer dots that go in between them that keep them insulated. And then when you push down on the top plate, it makes contact with the bottom plate. And, and that, uh, when that happens, uh, then you can, if you're applying a voltage to one of the plates and the other plate you're, you're not applying anything to across its electrodes, then you can connect one of those inputs to, a, to an A to D converter and read the voltage. And that tells you where the position is. And then you multiplex it. Then you tri-state the, the, the ground and 3.3 volts that we're giving you a, a, essentially a, you know, a voltage divider on the one plate. And you connect them to the A to D reader. And then you put the, the, the voltage across the other plate, ground and 3.3. And now you have a voltage divider in the Y direction. So you read the X. And then you switch around, you read the Y. But that's all set up for you. All you have to do is just, is just, just a. Uh, uh, I think it's set up to, well, you, you um, yeah, I guess you just have to call the function and get a value. 
And so, and then you convert the value, the raw value to a calibrated value, and then you decide what to do with it, with your PID controller. Okay, um, let's see. So, so the standard servo signal is this, is all, you know, the standard servo uses a 50 Hertz pulse repetition frequency. And the, the part of that signal, I, I guess I'll share my screen again. I think I went over this, but I'll, I'll do this again because this is kind of important. Okay. Okay, can, can you see this over here? Yes. Sir. Yes. All right. So here's a so here's a PWM signal. Okay. So so let's say we'll we'll have a couple of pulse periods. So this is this is 20 milliseconds, or 50 hertz. And here it is again. And here it is again. Now now, so the the output of the PWM. So you've got the micro here, and here's your PWM channel here, and it, the pin's coming out here, and and this is what the signal looks like. So it, it pops out and you get, uh, now our, ours is center line. So, so our, our, our time when it, it, the signal is high is in the center of the window, but we'll do it edge aligned, it doesn't really matter. And so it starts off high and it stays high for a certain amount of time and then it goes low. And then it does the same thing. It starts off high, stays high for a certain amount of time and goes low. The percentage, the percentage of time here is the duty cycle. So, and which varies from zero to 100%. So, so that's the duty cycle. Now, that was one of the problems with the existing code. It was set up so that, so that you could only put in a number from zero to 100, an integer. And there, you couldn't have any fractional proportion. And the problem is that the way the PWM is set up, your several is when you have, uh, when you, when, so this is, zero milliseconds, one millisecond, two, three, all the way to 20 milliseconds. So this is 20 milliseconds here. And so this isn't very representative. Well, from one millisecond to two milliseconds, that's the entire range that the servo goes from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. So if you think about it, if you do zero to 100, all you have are 10 counts from, one to tw from, from uh, 10 to 20. And so that's not very good resolution. And the, and the center would say be five. So six would be a little bit tilted one way and four would be a little bit tilted the other way. 10 would, 10 would be all the way tilted and uh, 20 would be all the way tilted the other way. And so it turns out that's pretty bad. So I had to modify that code. So we would at least have zero to a thousand. So so, so instead of percentage, we're doing parts per thousand. And, uh, and now you've at least got 100 points across here instead of 10. So once the signal, once, if the signal stays up past 20, 20 milli, past the two, the two millisecond point, it stays up all through here. It doesn't, it doesn't change the position of the servo. And if, the, and, if it's, and if the signal just is up for, if it's up for just a little bit here, you know, like for, like for, you know, half a millisecond, and then it's down up to 20 milliseconds, and then and then it's up again for another half. So the signal would repeat continuously until you change the duty cycle. But if you have it here, it's it's just going to be full minus 90. It can't go any further. And and if it's out here to, to two, it's going to be full plus 90. You can't go any further. So you only get control over that little small range of the whole 20 milliseconds. Now, it turns out the servos will actually work if it's only 10 milliseconds. So I've actually shortened this to a 10 millisecond period to cheat a little bit. And, and then I changed the duty side from you know, zero to 100 to zero to 1,000. So actually you've got 200 points across your area of interest now, which is probably more than the servo could actually do. So it's, it's, so it's fine. All right, anyway. So the standard servo that wants a 20 millisecond period or a 50, or a 50 hertz frequency, pulse repetition. So, so the same pulse, this pulse occurs every, every, every uh, 50 times a second, essentially. And the width of the pulse is the duty cycle. Does that make sense? Okay. You probably already knew that, but whatever. All right. 
Um, so general hobby servos will go plus, or, you know, go 180, zero to 180 or plus minus, minus 90 plus 90, however you want to look at it. Uh, the, and um, so the, the A to D in the KL25Z has, can have 16 bits of resolution, but we're only using 12 bits. So it's, it's set to 12. Um, so can somebody tell me what it means that we say that KL25Z has a nested vectored interrupt controller? You can interrupt and interrupt. So you can set the uh, levels of priority, basically. Right, so that's nested. And what does the vector mean? You can, uh, because uh, this one is DMA, so you can basically go directly to the location of the vector uh, of the of the uh, interrupt, right? Yeah, that's sort of right. It's got nothing to do with DMA, but the but there's a table, and there's 32 different interrupt sources on this chip, and every one of those 32 interrupts can have its own separate interrupt service routine, and whichever one of the 32 interrupts occurs, it will go to that specific interrupt service routine for that number of interrupt. Some of them are associated with modules like the A to D converter and the UART, and there's three UARTs, so one's for UART zero, one's for UART one, one's for UART two, and then and then they're also for all the ports, so any, any of the pins in any of the ports, but I think each port only has one interrupt, because obviously they're there's a lot more pins in 32, so. But you go to the, so if one of the port A pins causes an interrupt and you have another interrupt on a port A pin, then you'll have to deconflict those. You'll have to look at the, at the interrupt flags for port A and see which ones actually are, are cause the interrupt, or maybe they're both high, in which case you have to service both of them. But you would go to the port A interrupt service routine specifically. Then it, so then if you had an interrupt for port A, port B, port C, each one of those could have a separate interrupt service routine. And that's probably what you do. You probably wouldn't want to have two port A pins both being turned on for interrupts because then you'd have to deconflict that. You'd rather have one for port A and one for port B. If you have three, one for port C, whatever. So you would go to the right interrupt routine automatically and not have to waste any time sorting that out in, in your code. All right. Um, so we've got 128K of flash, 16K of RAM. Um, so, so the programmer's model. So you should know that there, there's, there's, there are overall 16 registers in the programmer's model, 13 general purpose registers, eight low registers, five high. And then there is a link register. There's a stack pointer, a link register, and a program counter. Those are the other three. So 13 plus three, that's 16. That's, that's the program. That's the programmer's model. There's also then the register with the status information in it, but I, I won't pimp you about that. But you should know the status. It's got four status bits. It's got the carry bit, the zero bit, the negative bit, and the two's complement overflow bit, which is the V bit. Um, let's see. So normally, normally, uh, normally we want to we want to break our designs into functional parts. And as much as we can, we want to get each one of those parts figured out, and then and then we can put them together with some confidence that our parts are going to work. Um, so, good programming practices, you know, things like using meaningful names. Um, uh, you should avoid super clever programming tricks that nobody else can understand. Um, yeah, you definitely want to. Yeah, yeah, you you want your code to be maintainable. It's amazing how often when program codes written, you never think that twenty years later it's going to be running still, but it may very well be. It probably will be. In most cases. Um, all right. Uh, scope of variables. Do, do you do you know what I mean when I talk about the scope of a variable? No. Anybody? All right. Well, so let me shift out of this so I can see everybody again. All right. So, so every time you declare a variable, 
there, there, it, it, it has a defined scope for, for where its definition applies. And outside of that scope, the variable, no, then other software that's outside of the scope can't access that variable. So for instance, if you define a variable inside a function, its scope is within that function. And usually that means, unless you declare it as static, when that function is called, it comes into existence. And when the function exits, it goes out of existence. Now you can declare it in a function and append the, 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 the keyword static to it, then it will not go out of existence, but it still only has scope within that function. If you want to have scope outside that function, then, then that's where you have to use things like global variables and externals. Global variables have scope within everything in the same file. So if you have a global variable defined, say in your main file, and you have functions defined in your main file as well, then uh, are, are even included in your main file with includes, then, then, uh, then they'll, they'll be defined. But if you have other, other actual physical files that are being linked with your program before it's being uh, uh, put into memory, then those other files uh, won't see those global variables unless you call them external. So you have to append the keyword external to your global to let it go across files. Um, if, you define the if you define your variable inside of main, then it will only have scope within main. And outside of main, it can't be seen. So no function can see your variables. Your interrupt service routine can't see your variables uh, that are defined within your function main. And so um, you normally want to limit scope so that, and the reason, why do, why do you think you want to limit the scope of a variable? And, and strict C programmers try like the Dickens to avoid globals. What they'll do is they'll create structures and header files and then, and then pass pointers to the structures. But, but they, they want to avoid globals because it's easy to change a global someplace and forget that you did it. It's a little harder to do that with pointers because you have to be a little more intentional with pointers, I guess. I don't know. But anyway. um, very quick question. Yeah. So the global is ha, has a higher level than external? No, it's, 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 its scope is less than external. OK, OK. So the external, you call it ex is, for example, like libraries. Yeah. So, so external, it gives it complete scope. Everything can, every function, every piece of code can see an external global. OK, thank you. I guess the exception of that would be compiled code, but even there, they have tags and and they can link in the tags and 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 fix that. So I think uh, I think even there, even pre-compiled code can, if it's declared as externals, it'll 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 resolve the externals in that in that pre-compiled code at at link time. I don't know that that gets into esoterics beyond my abilities. Um, all right, so remember. All of the all of the uh, assembly language instructions can access the the low uh, general purpose registers, but the five highs can only be accessed by a handful of the the standard instructions. Um, so, uh, so remember, everything in this chip is in a is in a is in a four gigabit uh, memory space, and I went through this in the video, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. You should look at the video, but but just remember that. Uh, that every location in that four gigabyte spit, uh, space, uh, I mean, is hardly, you know, what, maybe 1% of it's actually implemented with something. Most of it is blank because, for, you know, there's, there's 16K of RAM, 128K of flash, and maybe a, a K or two of, uh, of special function registers. So, I mean, if you think about it, that that's not very much out of four billion. So uh, most of that four billion is, is, is blank, but, but every location is, is essentially referencing eight bits. Every location stands for a byte. So when you wanna talk about a word, they have to be byte, they have to be correctly byte aligned. They have to be address aligned. And for words, you have to be on either a zero location uh, or a location that ends in four or location that ends in eight or C. Otherwise, it's not properly byte aligned. So in other, in other words, every 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 fourth byte starting from zero 
would be a byte aligned word or a memory aligned word, properly aligned word. For half word, you just have to have an even address. So all the half words start on an even address. And if you try and reference a half word with an odd address, you will get a system error. And if same with it with a four byte full word, if you if you're not on zero, four, eight, or C, it'll get an error. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the serial protocols. So, so somebody tell me what are what, what are the serial protocols you should know a little something about? SP, uh, I yeah. squared C. SPI, and I squared C, SPI that's two. And uh, UART. Yeah, those are the three I want you to know about. Okay, so let's talk about them. So which one would you have, uh, would you have, um, where, which ones do you generate the clock only at one end in the master? Is it the UART, that one? The, the UART is the one example where you generate the clock at both ends when you normally, when you use it in the asynchronous duplex mode that we, we use. Now there is a, there is a single ended clock mode that's synchronous that, that's not used very much uh, where the clock's only generated at one end, but forget that we, you probably won't even see that because that's pretty um, that's pretty rare, I think. So normally, the UART we generate the clock at both ends. So at each end, we normally have to specify the baud rate, and we 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 they have to be the same, or we'll probably have a problem. We won't get a good you know we won't be communicating. Now some most of the modules have the ability to auto detect baud rates if they're set up to do that. Uh, this chip will the pick even our little pick chip will do that, but but it takes a bit of programming to do that, and so most of the time we just pick a baud rate and we run at that. And we don't we don't auto detect. All right, so so then SPI has only the clock generated in the master, and I squared C only has the clock generated in the master, and they both have a clock line because. Obviously, if you generate the clock at one end, you're going to have to transmit it to the other end. Whereas in UART, there's no clock line. You have a you have a you have a a, a transmit and a receive line, but that's it. And that's one nice thing about the UART: you don't have to have a clock line. In I squared C, we only have two lines there too because our data line is bidirectional. But in our UART, data lines are not bidirectional; they only go one way. So the transmit always sends data out of your device. The receive always lets data come in. Same on the other end. So on that, you always connect, your transmit connects to the receiver's receive. The receiver's transmit connects to your receive. But in I squared C, your serial data out connects to the serial data out. Uh, well, it's actually the SDA. Uh, serial data connects to serial data and serial clock connects to serial clock. SCL and SDA connect to each other. Whereas in SPI, you have you have that's where you have you have by you have single direction lines for the most part. There is such a thing as bidirectional lines in SPI, but they're not used much. We almost always use serial data out and serial data in, and you have to connect serial data out to the serial data in of your slave, and the serial data out of your slave connects to your serial data in of your master. Now, you can also call these MISO, MISO and MOSI, master out, slave in and master in, slave out. And then if you're calling a MISO and MOSI, MISO connects to MISO and MOSI connects to MOSI. So that's a, bit, <coughs> a better way to do it, but apparently it's copywritten and a lot of people avoid using it because they don't want to get yelled at. So, but MISO and MOSI is, makes more sense, easier to connect. Um, and then the clock goes to clock. So in SPI, you normally have to have MISO, MOSI, clock, and you also typically have to have a slave select line. And, uh, and so, so you need four lines plus power and ground for SPI, two lines plus power and ground for I squared C. And if you're only transmitting one way with UART, you only need one line plus power and ground. But if you're going bi-directional, then you do need two lines. So UART has the potential. Uh, in one of the PIC labs, I use the UART to write to the screen and then I use the other pin in the UART to uh, to get data in from some other place. I think when some lab. 
So you can actually split the function up. The transmit line can be talking to a different receiver and the, and the receive line can be coming from a different, uh, from some other machine in the UART. I mean, I don't know that, usually you wouldn't wanna do that, but if you only need to send data one way, it's really nice because then your UART gives you the ability to uh, only turn on the transmitter and transmit or only turn on the receiver and receive. But if you do want to, but then if you do have a need to listen to one thing and talk to another thing, and you don't have to do bi-directional with both of them, then you can actually split your UART up like that. It's kind of nice. UART's not as fast as, as uh, the fast. So what's the fastest protocol? SPI. That's correct. It runs in megahertz ranges. And that's why if you're, if you have a fancy A to D chip, uh, you know, like for like for a CD player or something like that, uh, then or a real real high fat you know real high fast D to A chip or something, then then you uh, then you would probably uh, you would almost always interface that with SPI to get the fast data rates. Usually I squared C 400k is as fast as it goes, and remember that's one bit at you know each. Each cycle, the most you can send is one bit, plus you have to send out some extra words to get stuff started. And so it's just not anywhere near as fast. And, and some of it even runs slower than that, um, sometimes 100K. Whereas SPI is megahertz. The UR can be pretty fast, but it's it's 115, 2000 baud rate, something like that, but not megahertz rates. Okay, um, let's see. So. So, um, so which 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 serial protocols have a slave address? Is it is it both the SPI and the I squared IC? So so I squared I squared yeah I squared C has uh, has slave addresses. Uh, SPI usually doesn't. You have a slave a select line, and that's how this. So when you you have a, a, a usually a dedicated wire to every slave, and that's how you t let the slave know you want to talk to it. You take its slave select line and take it to ground, and you make sure that your other slaves their lines are high, so you're not talking to them. Uh, and then then the slave that's that you have selected is going to going to interact with you. Uh, now there are there are some with the UART there 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 are such a thing as addresses with UARTs. If, you, if you're using the synchronous mode and stuff, but that's really rare. We don't really use that. So for all intents and purposes, I squared C is the only one with slave addresses. And they do come in seven bit and 10 bit addresses, but I, I've never seen one with a 10 bit address. So I don't think that's very common. Uh, so. Let's see. So which protocols can have multiple slaves? I squared IC. Yeah, and you are. S O U R. No. S P I. Yes. Okay. So make sure you don't copy off of Ahmed. Okay. <laughs> oh At least on that question, he may yeah. be smart on some other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> copy selectively. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, let's say you have an array. Uh, you know, like X and you define it as having, say it's an N array and it has a, and you give it a size of 20. If you just use the word X by itself, how does C interpret that? That's does anybody know? What's that? It's a variable. No, so actually, it's a it's it, it it's a constant it's a constant variable. Okay, but in this case, the, the the array name by itself is a constant, and actually that means you can't change it. But it's something else too. It's a pointer. Yes. So when you use the name all by itself, it becomes a constant pointer, which means it it's a pointer and you can pass it, but you can't change it because it's defined as a constant. It's kind of tricky. But it, it is definitely a pointer. Now, when you add when you add a index to it, now it's now it is a dereferenced pointer, pointing to that variable. So if you say a if you say x bracket five close bracket, 
now you're only talking about element five in the array X. But if you want to use, if you wanted to assign the address, that address to a pointer, then you could actually put in parentheses, you could put in parentheses X plus five, and that would be interpreted as a pointer to element five in the array. So it's kind of, and then you can always use the ampersand. You can use X bracket five. You can ampersand that and assign that to a pointer. That would get, take the address of that variable. It, I don't, anyway, I'm not going to pimp you with a bunch of that stuff. There's just a couple of questions, maybe maybe one or maybe one. <laughs> so don't worry about it. And the test only counts for seven percent, so it's no big deal. If you if you if you do good on your project and do all the labs, you've already got fifty percent of your grade, so you'll be fine. People in micro two get A's and B's, and that's it, unless they don't do anything. All right. Um, okay, how many wires does our resistive touch panel have? I know I, that. <laughs> I know Ahmed knows this one. <laughs> I made it to 32 minutes of your review, so I'm not sure yet. <laughs> okay, well. I have 30 to go. <laughs> it's just four. <laughs> okay, okay, now I know. All right. I was about to say three, but I knew I was missing one. Yeah, yeah, you have to have one for the left, one for left, one for right, one for top, one for bottom, mm -hmm. or front back. I, I think I call them front back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although we're, we are running an eight, we are running a four pair conductor, <laughs> but we're, but we've duplicated the wires. So there's only four unique signals, even though there's eight wires, which is a little confusing. And, and the pairs aren't matched correctly either. <laughs> Ahmed can tell you all about that. He's a, he's an expert on that. It's got to do with crosstalk noise and stuff. I don't know. It's all part of the, you know, it's all part of the cat five and cat six and cat 5e and cat 6e and all that standard stuff. Yeah, actually I was thinking about uh, the two touch panels that didn't work. And I was thinking about like three terminating both ends and or using a different wire because they might be yeah. uh, a problem with the uh, well, connection. I was thinking about that too. And, and I started worrying that maybe the panel is already touching in some place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we didn't check that because we should have checked between, uh, you know, we checked that there was 600 ohms between one pair and 300 between the other, but we should have checked between the pairs that shouldn't be talking to each other to see if they're talking. Yeah. And it could be in the wiring. It could be in the wiring. I'll bring a small uh, jumper uh, with me tomorrow. Yeah, 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 be good. yeah, we might be able to, yeah, we might be able to, we might be able to put a new connector on and fix it. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I have connectors too, I'll bring some. Uh, yeah, I've got a whole bunch too. Okay. I think there's some there already. I did. I did put on the six new uh, uh, plugs, and I got ten ball bearings a day. So I think we're good. I've got at least twelve of them. So, cool. Yeah, we should be good. So anybody that wants to come pick a touch table up should do that tomorrow. You know, get a little group together and and get a touch table, even if it's only two or three people. I I don't think we'll run out of them. We've got. We should have about. We should have sixteen or so that'll work, and some of them may need a little help. We'll we'll help you get it. That we, but Ahmed and I've worked on a lot, and they're they're in pretty good shape. They're not too bad. They, they're a lot better than they've ever been. <laughs> that's for sure. Oh my God. All right. I think that's most of the stuff. I don't know. Do you guys have any questions about anything? Not right now for me, but will you be able, like, available through email tomorrow, just in case? You can text me. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Yeah, I still have to finish up the review video and such. So, if you did a review video, I think I went over pretty much everything. I don't think I there's not much. Um, yeah, yeah, it should be fine. All right, everybody else okay? Uh, Doctor Morton, for yeah. the for the tilt table project, can we work by ourselves, or do we have to be on a team? You don't have to be on a team, but if we run out of tables, then I'd like you to work with somebody else. But yeah, I think at this point, I, I you know, until we run out of tables, uh, uh, that's fine. I, I know there probably will be a handful of people, but yeah, there are probably people out there that would like to work with you. So 
No, we right. have the virtual one. Is that one by ourselves or? So, so what I'm, what I'm, if you, if you, if you don't want to come in and pick up a tote table, you can do the virtual thing, and mm -hmm. you can work by yourself. And I think what I'm going to have you do for the virtual thing is just do the exact same project. You just won't be able to test your code. Oh, okay, so we'll still be doing the tilt table. Then. Yeah, okay. I think I'll have you do the tilt table. What, what what you can do is just take a whack at at putting your code into the into the existing code. So and basically, you just have to read a value. Uh, you know, you you can. I guess you won't have to worry about calibrating it. So you can you can make up your own you can make up your own calibration and run it through the little calibration formula and put that in your code, and then and you know, okay. or you can use somebody else's numbers. I'll put I'll put up some. You know, I'll put I'll put up I'll measure some numbers, and I'll put those up. You can use those. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't finished. I've got to do a little video on how to do the calibration. It's a. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's kind of interesting, really. It's mm -hmm. it's linear algebra allows you to to you know take as many points as you want, and then plug it into this linear algebra formula, and boom, it just spits out your conversion value to take the to switch the raw data into a. You know, in, into a calibrated value, and the, the way here, I'll show you the way that works. It, it's really amazing. It, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Uh, let's see, do I have it? Well, I don't have that up, but uh, yeah, I'll show on this. So, so if you do, if you do, so so basically, let's say here's your touch panel. So you so you put your finger, you put it like your ballpoint pen here, and here here and here and then in the center. So you've got five points. And what you want to do, it, you want to take that out. So you can think of it like this. You can think of it, you know, here's your here's your sort of idealized touch panel where you call this zero, you call this 10 or maybe a maybe 100 and you call this, you know, 100. I don't know. Anyway, I did it with 10. But And then here's your actual touch panel. And the touch panel itself, it's not quite the same size as your idealized one because the numbers don't vary over the quite the same range. And then it's it's translated a little bit. So the center is not really in the center. And then it's rotated a little bit. So it's kind of, you know, so it doesn't even, you know, you, you'd like to think if you go from, if you go from this point to this point, that your X value, that your Y value would stay the same, but it doesn't. The Y value may change a little bit. And and uh, so hopefully it's not too nonlinear. That's the only problem. If it's real nonlinear, it, uh, this is a linear, transformation so you can't fix the nonlinear stuff but hopefully you can and so what you do is you take these these nine points that you make and you put them and you put those in a matrix and then you multiply that matrix by its inverse trans or by its uh, transformed and then that guarantees that it's invertible and then you invert that and you multiply it by the x vector and the y vector and and anyway you, you get you get you basically get the least squares uh best fit oh. And it does it for you all in the all in the linear algebra. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's crazy. So yeah. I'll, I'll probably do the lecture next week on that. And next week we're going to do the we're go through the calibration. I like everybody to go through it on MATLAB, because it's it's a it's a very useful feature. Because if you know if you ever have to mess with touch panels, you realize they have to be calibrated. And uh, and in the old days, back in the days when, when you know the first uh, I remember I had a Newton and. You had to recalibrate that freaking Newton all, all the time, because after you use it for a while, when you put your pen down on the touch panel, it wouldn't register correctly on the screen, because they're separate. You know, they're just they're two pieces of glass, and uh, and the signals come off separately. They do on your phone too. They're kind of you know they're packaged together, but but it, but if you break your touch panel, you can replace it without replacing your screen. And uh, and they actually have different cables and everything. But the, uh, Apple does such a great job. They somehow figure out how to how to do that all automatically for you on the fly, so you never have to worry about it. But but in the old days, all the cell phones you had to you had to touch with a stylus. You know the very they'd show a point, you touch it. Show a point, you touch it. Show a point, you touch it. And then that would calibrate your touch screen. But those days are gone. Pretty amazing. But they're still doing it. They're just doing it for you automatically. Interesting, huh? All right. Um, okay, I think that's good. All right. Any other questions? Everybody good? All right. Okay, you, you'll do fine. Just, just what you should do is read the question, 
And the first thought that comes in your mind should be your answer. And you'll probably get most of them right. Oh, Don't overthink them. I mean, if, if you put only one answer, then <laughs> that'll be easier. Well, there's a few. I, there, most of them. Okay, so there's. I, I guess I could. There's. I. I see one, two, three, four, five. Oh well. Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So there's thirteen multiple answers. There's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18 true, false. And then there's like, there's a few uh, single answer ones, so-called multiple choice. One, two, three, four. And then there's some numeric ones, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There's 11 numerical answers. That's it, that's all there is. What time is the test gonna be available at eight? Uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, no. I'll probably make it. I'll probably make it start like at six a.m. or something. I wouldn't make it start at midnight, but I, I haven't done it yet. I, if I get it done by midnight, I'll make it start at midnight, and it'll go till midnight tomorrow night, or well, eleven fifty-nine. Midnight tonight is actually the first tick of the clock for Friday. It's confusing, right? But midnight is actually Friday, whereas eleven fifty-nine is the end of the day. All right. Okay. Well, you guys study hard. I'm sure you'll do well. And I'll post the video. All right. Thank you very much. All right.